Metabolic therapy could potentially change the way we think about cancer treatment. Now, if you or a loved one have a diagnosis of cancer, I encourage you to discuss any changes you make, whether they are dietary, supplements, or medications, with your treating physician first. In my opinion, there will be very few cases where metabolic therapy cannot be implemented. However, there might be this one or other case where there might be an issue and your treating doctor knows best usually, okay? They may not be aware of this. So again, um, something that you might have to explain to them because you know this is again something that is fairly new and a lot of um, physicians are not aware of this treatment, right? Okay, so let's get started. What is metabolic therapy for cancer? Well, when we think about cancer treatment, most of us immediately think about traditional methods like surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, right? But there's another approach, which is metabolic therapy. So chemotherapy targets any cell that divides at a fast rate, right? And since cancer cells have a very fast uh, rate of division, they are certainly targeted, but as are some of the other cells in your body, for example, the hair follicles, right? Or the cells in your digestive tract, which leads to a lot of side effects, obviously. So when we target cells that have a fast rate of division, we're not only targeting cancer cells, but we're targeting cells like hair cells. So hair loss, you're gonna have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, gastrointestinal issues, malabsorption of nutrients, and so on. And there are huge side effects, of course, there, right? Um, it's a very crude treatment, but that's still at the point, at this point, it seems to be the standard of care, even though I think this is something that, you know, sometimes we overuse and also certainly brings with it a lot of side effects and a lot of risks for uh, your life after this uh, chemotherapy is implemented. Again, I'm not trying to influence anybody about the treatment that they are uh, discussing with their physician, but just keep in mind, every treatment will have some side effects. And in this case, I think these are pretty severe side effects. Surgery, of course, is, you know, trying to cut out as much as you can off this tumor to decrease the load in there, you know, as much as you can to take out. In some cases, surgery can be curative where the whole tumor is taken out, of course, right? And radiation is certainly implemented and is getting better and more precise where externally you're having this uh, beam of, of radiation that targets the cancer cell or the tumor to shrink it down, right? Those are the methods that we had until now. Very crude and a lot of side effects. Metabolic therapy approaches this a bit differently, right? So when we talk about metabolic therapy, I'm going to talk in very simple terms about cell biology and just going to re review a couple of things so we're all on the same page. So this is a normal cell. In the cell, we have the nucleus and the nucleus is the DNA. DNA is our genetic material, our genetic blueprint, right? And we certainly know that there are mutations in the DNA in cancer cells. So that's been established, of course, right? We also have these mitochondria and mitochondria, you may remember from high school biology is where your energy is produced, right? You take the glucose molecule, goes in the mitochondria and they have this thing called the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. And they make out of this glucose molecule, they make ATP, which is the energy currency that the cell needs to live. The cell needs this to live, to incorporate proteins, to produce things and to divide, right? This is hugely important for any cell, right? And um, in a healthy cell, these mitochondria work very well. And, you know, together with oxygen in an oxygen rich environment, the cell can take in glucose, so sugar molecule right here, and uh, go through oxidative phosphorylation. This is this citric acid cycle that you've learned about in biology and produce 36 ATP. So it makes a lot of energy from one molecule, right? So here's where it becomes interesting. Cancer cells, when you look at them, not only do they have mutations in their DNA, but they also have malfunctioning mitochondria. And that is pretty much true for all cancer cells. So the cancer cells, these mitochondria, they don't look beautiful like this with all these little you know, uh, uh, formations here, these folds in here, but they look almost empty. They look like this. They call them also ghost mitochondria sometimes. And these mitochondria, they cannot use um, this sugar molecule and do this oxidative phosphorylation and get a lot of energy out of it. They can only ferment. And fermentation is a simple way to break down a sugar molecule and it only yields two ATP per sugar molecule. So it's a really poor energy, energy production, right? So 36 in a healthy cell, if oxygen is present. In a cancer cell, even if oxygen is present, they can only do two ATP. What does that mean? That means cancer cells need a lot of sugar. And you might have heard this before. Cancer loves sugar. Cancer cells thrive on sugar, right? This is really important for them to exist, right? Where do we use this in medicine? We use it, for example, when we do a PET scan. So a PET scan is where we take uh, sugar molecules and we put a radioactive label on them, right? And then we inject them into a person and then after this is taken up, we're going to do some imaging of the person. And the interesting part here is because we know that cancer cells divide very rapidly and they need a lot of sugar. 
So remember, they can only ferment. So per sugar molecule, they only get 2 ATP. So they've taken a lot of sugar in. That means also they've taken in a lot of these radioactive uh, um, molecules on there, right? And then when you do a PET scan and you do the imaging, the areas that light up because they have a lot of this radioactive material incorporated, those are the, the cancer uh, sites in, in the body, right? That's how a CAT scan works. So we're using this, knowing this, in some of the imaging technologies that we have, right? And there were some studies done that, uh, you know, implemented a ketogenic diet. They said, look, we understand that cancer needs a lot of sugar. How about we cut the sugar out? And that was successful in some people. In certain cancers, people really went into remission. The cancer went away. There's some documentaries about this. You know, this has been documented in literature. Some people, only by changing this, by going on a ketogenic diet, which means we're cutting out all the sugar and carbs. It's not just simple sugar, but, you know, carbohydrates like bread and pasta and all these things. And we're reducing that to less than 30 grams a day of carbohydrates, total carbohydrates. And we're forcing the body at this point to go to an alternative fuel source, which is ketones, right? And ketones are made in the liver by virtue of converting fat. So the body takes fat and the liver gets broken down into these ketone bodies. And these ketone bodies are used differently in mitochondria, right? So there's a ketone body metabolism. It actually runs very clean. The interesting thing is, and you might hear this from people that go on a ketogenic diet, many people start to lose body fat and they're generally becoming healthier. The diabetes improves. So there's some benefits, at least, you know, short term. Long term, different issues. That's a different video. But I think a ketogenic diet can be useful even in people that are not diagnosed with cancer because short term, we can see some benefits there, right? Okay, so these ketone bodies can be used by our healthy cells, but they cannot be used by a cancer cell. Cancer cells cannot use ketones, right? And if there is a cancer that uses glucose as its only fuel by fermenting it, and you're taking the glucose away, then those cells die. And then the cancer cells go away, right? That's the whole idea. Now, this is, unfortunately, this didn't hold true for everybody with cancer. And there were many studies done where it didn't work. And I was also fascinated by this. I said, well, why does it not work for everybody? Because it sort of made sense. Now, this is where Dr. Seyfried's work come in. Okay, so Dr. Thomas Seyfried, he looked at this for many, many years now, and he looked at all different kinds of uh, cancer lines. And he said, well, they seem to not only use glucose and fermenting that, but they can ferment a second fuel source, which is glutamine. Glutamine is a non-essential amino acid. Non-essential means it's an amino acid that our own body can generate. So you don't have to necessarily take it in from, from food, from, from proteins, but your own body can make it, right? which is not great, so we can't easily cut it out. So even if I restricted your diet of all proteins, you would still make glutamine, right? So it can't be influenced by diet very much. It can to some extent, but not great. So he said, well, some cancers predominantly use glucose, and those are the ones that on a ketogenic diet did really well, right? These people get better. But then there are some cancer cells that also use glutamine, and they did not get better, you know? They got a little bit better maybe because they might use both fuels, right? But because they can live fairly well on glutamine, this, this cancer didn't go away just by putting them on a ketogenic diet. So what he said, well, we have to block both. But then the question was, of course, how do you block glutamine, a non-essential amino acid, right? And he figured out a way. And that uh, is a medication that was developed in the 1950s already called DON. It's an abbreviation. So DON or 6-diazo-5-oxonorleucine has been around since the 1950s. And what it does, it blocks the production and uptake of glutamine. So this cannot be given all the time in higher doses. So they either give it low dose continuously or they give it once or twice a week in a higher dose because they can only block this intermittently. And in that time, again, so the patient is on a ketogenic diet, so they're not using, eating any sugar, so there's no glucose coming in. And then they're blocking glutamine, the second fuel that many of those cancer cells are using, right? And now the cancer cell, and cancers, remember, they need a lot of energy. So even if you cut out glutamine for a short time, they can't survive usually. And that's how this whole thing works, right? You're taking away the fuel that these cells need to live and these cells die off, right? Now, the DON is, um, you know, in, under, under study, but it's not available commercially yet. So that means most clinics are not able to use this in my, that's at least my understanding. They're using this for research purposes. However, there are some supplements that also block or decrease uh, glutamine. Either they block the production of glutamine or the uptake of uh, glutamine. 
and they can be used even on a daily basis. Uh, again, always you should discuss all of this with your treating physician. But there are things like berberine, there's green tea extract, and a few others, uh, even some medications like some um, anti-malaria drugs have been shown to block glutamine. So again, that's something that you could discuss with your physician, you know, um, but it is possible to at least decrease the amount of glutamine coming in. And remember, these cells need a lot of this, and if we're, if we're blocking it, even to some extent, people tend to get better. Another therapy that this could, and in my opinion, should be combined with is intermittent fasting. Now, a lot of times this is done for several days once a month. So some people do like a five-day fast once a month. Some people do one day, like a 24-hour period every week of intermittent fasting. Because remember, most of your cells, when you go into a, a fast, again, you're running on ketones, your body works just fine. You have plenty of fat, you know, even if you're thin, there's plenty of fat that the body can use to, to uh, generate energy. Um, however, again, this is a fuel that cancer cells cannot use and taking that away for prolonged, prolonged periods of time, more cells die off, which is really a fascinating concept, right? Again, discuss this with your physician. Sometimes if you have a patient where, you know, they're very, very thin already and malnourished, they might not want to go on intermittent fasting. So all these things should be discussed with your treating physician. Now, one thing that Dr. Seyfried points out is that in his belief is that cancer starts as a metabolic disorder. So in other words, it's the mitochondria, these guys here, that first get damaged. As they get damaged, they produce uh, radical oxygen species. So these really, really dangerous molecules that then damage the DNA. Because remember, cancer cells have both. They have damaged DNA and malfunctioning mitochondria. And according to Dr. Seyfried, it starts with the mitochondria. Therefore, he believes that cancer should be thought of as a metabolic disorder. And metabolic therapy then would be the first thing we should absolutely do and implement. Now, this can be used together with chemotherapy and maybe with chemotherapy at a lower dose to reduce side effects. These are all possibilities. And I think it's important not to close the door on those things either. You know, uh, Some people might implement metabolic therapy and it might not work sufficiently for them for various reasons. But then if they do this together with low-dose chemotherapy, suddenly they get very good results. So I think it should be very open. And as I said, discuss these things with your primary care or your oncologist to uh, see what would work for you. One reason why sometimes metabolic therapy doesn't work well is because people are not really in, a, in, a, in ketosis. So they are still taking in too many carbohydrates. And it's not easy to follow this, right? It's something that you really got to do a lot of um, research to understand what you can eat and what you shouldn't eat. And then you should test yourself. Either there's these urine sticks you can get, or you can take a, um, a, a little uh, finger prick and test your blood to see where your ketone uh, levels are. That's actually very important to do, right? But I think this is very um, fascinating that um, this is here. I would agree. It makes sense to me that um, cancer can be thought of as a metabolic disorder. Studies have been done. I'm going to do another video about this to show that when you have a um, cancer cell with a cancer nucleus, and you put that damaged nucleus into a healthy cell with healthy mitochondria, it is not a cancer cell anymore. So again, and vice versa, if you put a healthy cell with healthy DNA into a cancer cell with damaged mitochondria, it continues to be a cancer cell. So that kind of shows us that it seems to be that at least <clears throat> from these studies, the mitochondria are more important in understanding why a cell is a cancer cell than the damage in the DNA, right? So I think there's a lot of merit to this uh, a theory, and it's been used at least in small in a small number of cases very successfully. It's been used in cell lines, and um, the research from Dr. Seyfried I think is very fascinating. He's looked at many different cell lines. One criticism was people will say, "Well, what about fatty acids? You know, can't tumors use fatty acids?" According to him, he hasn't found any lines yet that use fatty acids. So to summarize, metabolic therapy uses the underlying principle that cancer cells have malfunctioning mitochondria, and they can only ferment, which is a very simple way of energy production, glucose and glutamine. And by taking both of those away, these cells will die. And I think it's a fascinating concept. I think it should be implemented by virtually anyone diagnosed with cancer, of course, after talking to your oncologist or your uh, other treating physicians, making sure there's no contraindications to this. And it can certainly use, be used together with other modalities. It can be used even with low dose of chemotherapy. Of course, it can be used with things like surgery, right? I think these are complementary to each other. I think that uh, physicians should educate themselves on this. I think it's hugely important, and I think it should be the 
fundamental in treatment. Again, only my opinion, always check with the doctor first, right? All right, so please um, subscribe and leave a comment or question. A lot of my content is strongly influenced by the comments of questions that I get. Thank you very much.